This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. One vitally important aspect of a satisfying and productive lifestyle is a total balance of the various elements. One psychiatrist has said that whenever he's dealing with a patient with anxiety and nervous irritability, he always asks the patient if he plays golf. The doctor says if the patient says no, I tell him to start. If he says yes, I tell him to stop. Discovering an ideal balance between work and relaxation, between vocation and recreation, is an individual matter. But it is of extreme importance. He who will not make time for relaxation must eventually make time for illness. Consider another balancing aspect of life. Dr. Nathan Ackerman, a psychiatrist specializing in family relations, states, The single most encompassing reason for our conspicuous failure thus far to prevent mental illness derives from our failure to cope with the mental health problems of family life. A loving and supportive family relationship is important to optimum life function. And so is the element of hope and a positive future philosophy. And another instance of the psychology of the self-fulfilling prophecy, an affirmative attitude of mind will tend to create more positive reactions and relationships. The unequivocally held conviction that all human beings on this earth are children of God, are valuable, are spiritual brothers and sisters, will in turn reflect those higher meanings and values into every circumstance and relationship of daily living. Another psychologist, Professor W.I. Thomas, has established what psychology now calls the Thomas Theorem, which is the following, quote, if you define a situation as real, it becomes real in its consequences. For example, if you define yourself in your own mind as worthless, you will then begin to act and react and think of yourself and behave as if you were worthless. You have defined that situation as real and it has become thus real in its consequences in your life. If, conversely, you define your situation differently and yourself differently. If you define your situation as that of being valuable in the universe, a personality of power and potential with momentous reasons for being alive, for breathing each breath of air, that definition will likewise become real in its consequences. An occasion comes to mind in which I was once invited to be the guest lecturer in a high school psychology class in Los Angeles. In order to illustrate these principles, such as the W.I. Thomas theorem, I outlined two opposing self-definitions and asked the students to think through the consequences of each definition. I said, suppose you thought of yourself or defined yourself as worthless, a non-essential, mere evolutionary excrescence of the universe without any reason or destiny, that you were a mere planetary biological accident without a soul, without a spiritual dimension. Suppose you thought of yourself that way. Suppose you defined yourself in that fashion. What would your behavior tend to be? The students, assuming that premise for a moment, answered that life would probably feel futile and frustrating. One would spend little energy in loving and relating unselfishly to others. That one would tend to be egocentric, depressed, purposeless, unhappy with that view of oneself. But then I said to the class, now consider the opposite view. You have just analyzed how you would feel, act, and react if you held the lowest possible definition of yourself and of your place in the universe. But now consider how you would feel, act, and react if you held the highest reasonable view of yourself and your place in the universe. Imagine that you held a concept firmly in your mind, that you were a son or daughter of the universe, a child of God, that all eternity lay before you, an endless Star Trek from here to the center of infinity. Suppose, I ask this high school psychology class, suppose that you held that view of yourself. How then would you feel, act, and react if that were your self-concept? Immediately, the students began to raise their hands, and several were practically bouncing in their chairs, eager to describe how one would feel believing that. It would be a positive way to live, they said. There would be a feeling of reason in being alive, an ability to love and to serve more unselfishly, a sense of progress and dynamism day by day. Remember again the W.I. Thomas theorem, quote, if you define a situation as real, it becomes real in its consequences, end of quote. 
The Harvard psychologist Eric Erickson once described the most consequential turning point in all of human life as the identity crisis. That is the point at which a person asks and answers for himself this three-word question, who am I? Many psychologists believe the way one answers that question, who am I, is the determination of the remainder of that individual's life. It is the most consequential question you ever ask, and the answer you give to it is the most consequential answer you will ever give. And the highest possible answer is that one is infinitely valuable, that you are an irreplaceable personality, a son or daughter of the living God, and a brother or a sister to all the peoples of this good green planet Earth, indwelt each one by sparks of divinity, the living essence of the living God. A powerful central purpose in one's life is fundamental to fully exuberant living. When Richard Carlson was personnel advisor to the University of Southern California, personnel director for the Farm Credit Administration in Washington, D.C., and a management consultant to several large corporations, he reported the result of one searching survey of 10,000 American men and women, which revealed the startling finding that over 90% of those questioned had no definite aim in life. What shall it profit a man if he succeeds in making a living but fails in making a life? Or as it is written in the scriptures, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but loses his own soul? The most overwhelmingly important aspect of human life, above and beyond all others, is the spiritual dimension. One's relationship to meanings, to values, to others, and to God wrote Henry David Thoreau, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. In a New England graveyard, there's a tombstone with this epitaph on it. Died at 30, buried at 60. If one does not develop an inner spiritual life, that is precisely what begins to happen. The noblest and the best within you begins to languish and to die. When they used to work mules down in the old coal mines, every Sunday the men would bring the animals up out of the shafts and let them spend a day in the sunlight because they knew that if they didn't, the mules would go blind. Any man or woman, any young person of any age, in industry or daily life who spends seven days a week, month after month, year after year, in the vocational mine shafts, obsessed and compelled by the interests of business or finance or education or work alone, and without taking time for some strolling in the sunlight, for some art, some beauty, for love and friendships, for the incomparable rewards of learning philosophic wisdom, the satisfactions of spiritual values, and above all, the finding and knowing of God as a father and a friend, not merely finding out about God, but finding God, not merely knowing intellectually about God, but knowing God personally and spiritually. If one does not take time for these things, one becomes blind to these things. No passing moment of your life or mine will ever come to us again. Never again will your heart beat this beat. Never again in the cycles of eternity will you breathe again this breath of air. Be spiritual philosopher enough to know these things and savor them and delight in the moment, each moment of life. For as the ancient Persian king had inscribed upon the ring he wore, I shall not pass this way again. To discover this spiritual dimension of life is thrilling, and if there's any single key to that discovery, it is to begin to permit oneself to flower, begin actualizing the full range of one's human possibilities. This means not only actualizing one's physical potentials by the maintenance of good health. It means not only actualizing one's mental potentials by the maintenance of clear and engaged intellectual processes, not only actualizing one's emotional potentials by cultivating positive feelings toward existence, it furthermore and indeed ultimately means actualizing one's spiritual potentials, achieving a dynamic and progressive spiritual life, a vital philosophy which deals with one's place not only in the family of humankind, but one's significance in the universe itself, addressing the meanings of life and death, 
the quest for supreme values, truth and beauty and goodness. And what of time and eternity? What of faith and hope? What of love and aesthetics? What of the great systems of thought which have absorbed the thinking of the most perceptive intellects in human history? Can these be casually disregarded by an advanced citizen of the 21st century? Dare any one of us dismiss with a wave of the hand the enduring thinking of a Socrates, a Plato, or Aristotle? the concepts of Spinoza and Kant, of Buddha and Lao Tse, of Moses, Isaiah, and Christ. It was Socrates himself who declared the unexamined life is not worth living. The three most important questions in the entire history of human thought are said to be, where did we come from, why are we here, and where are we going? The architect Buckminster Fuller lamented, that the great problem with spaceship Earth was that it did not come with an instruction manual, and neither, others have complained, did its passengers. The human animal has been variously described by philosophers and thinkers as an ingenious assemblage of portable plumbing, the most rational of all the primates, and as a mystic mingling of soil and soul. But whatever one's definition... How you do see yourself and think of yourself is of vast importance. Begin by recognizing your own uniqueness. Dr. Murray Bowen of Georgetown University Hospital has done studies which show that in just five generations, a child is a mixture of 64 families. And if you trace your ancestry back 10 generations, you find that you embody the characteristics of 1,024 families and so on. Each one of us is the totally unique result of thousands of years of diverse breeding genetics. And one of the most exciting things you can do is to set about discovering the resultant incredible potentials which yet lie latent within you. There is only one of you in all this universe, and you are that one. And to begin to see your life as a vital, dynamic, spiritual adventure, finding and knowing God and utilizing the full and entire spectrum of your human potentials and possibilities as a son or daughter of God is the beginning of life and life fully abundant. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviate it, SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.